Nice to be back here, despite the light. You know, they always put the lights in your figure. You don't see anything. But I see you if I do this. OK, so um, I am not in the field, to be clear. But I have se selected from what we have done over the years these pieces which, have, which can sort of fit together with what you are interested in. So um, molecular chemistry is what all chemists do. We, our trade is to make molecules. But when molecules get together, they are not alone anymore. They have other properties. And that is why there is a chemistry beyond the molecule, which is supramolecular chemistry, as we have termed it, in 1978, and which deals with the way molecules get together, the way they can recognize one another, the way, they, the way they can react on one another through this recognition, and also then the, how they can carry one another through a barrier, natural or synthetic, a barrier like a membrane. So the basic of all that is molecular recognition. Without molecular recognition, we would not exist because all our molecules in our body, of course, they recognize one another at the right time, at the right speed, at the right moment, at the right place in the cell, and so on. Now, this area, this molecular recognition has already been defined many, many years ago, although at that time it was not called molecular recognition. It was more mechanical type of way of looking at things. And it means that you need first to bind things together, but this is, happens through information between the, the objects which bind together. And one simple way of looking at it, very simple, is to say there is a complementarity in geometry and in uh, interactions. The person who proposed that, you all of you must know him, because otherwise you would not be bona fide chemists, is, of course, Emil Fischer. Emil Fischer is the one who, in 1894, wrote the very famous paper saying that they have molecules for acting one or the other one, have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, a log and a key. He was a professor in Strasbourg in 1874, because at that time, the French had lost the Franco-Prussian War, so Alsace became German. And thanks to that, we had a lot of very good people there. <laughs> no, it's really true that because that Germany tried to convince Alsatians to remain German. So we had the, the PhD father of Emil Fischer was Adolf von Bayer. And they had another, some other people of the same caliber. Not so bad. We are very happy about the fact that he got his PhD, of course, in our university. OK, so uh, the lock and key, since we talk about locks and keys, here are three keys and one lock. And of course, it's quite clear the red one fits into the other one. And many, many people, once this has been seen, and uh, I will show you the beginning of our work, but just uh, very briefly. Very, many, many people have been studying that from the basic point of view. How do you make locks for keys or keys for locks? Just to adapt them and to find out how this works. And uh, the first compounds we, may, we were interested in had to do with the something which looks very simple, but it's not so simple. How can you recognize spheres which have one positive charge from one another? So if you apply Emil Fischer's idea, then you say, OK, it has to have a size. And if you then, of course, beyond Emil Fischer, because he didn't talk much about type of interactions, you have also to have complementary interactions, like uh, positive charge interacting with a nitrogen uh, dipole and so on. And this are how we made that in that was a long time ago. Most of you were not born, probably. In 1967, uh, these were the three, three cages, which were adapted by synthetic means to the metal ion silicium, sodium, potassium. One reason was that sodium, potassium are very important for the propagation of the nerve influx along the nerve membrane. They have changes in concentration of sodium, potassium. OK, now the reason why I show that is because it was the first of what we were doing. But also many, many years later, I found out that the one which we call two to the one on the right, we have here, I think I was told that you cannot use a laser pointer in this country, of at least in this room. <laughs> because when it's a company, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know companies have special rules. So I found out that, in fact, one of these compounds was used in positron emission tomography. Because you need to introduce F18, and this has to do, go very quickly. 
And what happens is that if you have potassium fluoride and put the uh, potassium ion in a big bowl, then, of course, the fluoride is, is pushed away and is very unhappy, gets very reactive. And this one it works very well. And most of the uh, mat materials for positron em emission tomography is now done by this compound. I discovered that much later after it had been used many times already. OK, now other applications in life sciences involve, of course, drug discovery. Because what is a drug? The drug is a key for a biological lock. And you want to make the key as good as possible so that you have no side effects and this kind of things. I will come back a little bit more into that. Another thing is we made also other type of cavities which had uh, uh, the, 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 the surrounding the organic skin had pyridines, which could then absorb uh, UV light. And if you put a europium ion in the cavity, they transfer the energy from the europium, from the uh, organic residue to the europium, which then emits red light. And this also only happens when it is in a cavity, because europium, otherwise in water, is deactivated by interaction with water vibration, H2O vibrations. And this led to the development by uh, Gérard Matisse in a French, small French company, which is now much larger, uh, of an immunoanalysis system, which you see here, which is called crypto. I didn't like the name too much. It was a bit too, too crypto, you know, strong. But it's a machine which is now used in many hospitals. Then the gene transfer, of course, that is a, a, quite an obvious thing, that if you can bind things together, and sort of shield the interactions from one another or control the interactions, we can help things to go through a membrane. And uh, this is then uh, used for, uh, can be used for gene therapy and also for biotechnology. In a general public lecture, which I usually use this slide, I say, gene transfer is good for you. Genetically modified organisms, you want them. You don't want to throw them away. But I think, I hope you are convinced people. I'm not so sure, but. I'm, I, I very much think that genetically modified organisms, we need them. OK, then materials of supramolecular nature. That means, in this case, handling the type of interactions which occur between uh, molecules. And I will give you an example and of an application a bit later. Now, um, I wanted to show you also some results which are partially linked to what you are doing here in, uh, in this meeting but which have to do with the fact that we are animals using oxygen. We are aerobic animals, and oxygen is a very, very, very important molecule for us. Uh, without oxygen, first of all, it's, it doesn't live very long. But furthermore, many processes in the body happen in hypoxia or normoxia. No, sorry, usually hypoxia is, of course, not good for us, but normoxia, you have to try to restore it. And our idea there was to try to find a way to restore normal oxygen levels in tissues which are hypoxic. So I cannot go into all that because we worked on it 20 years and not much known that we worked on that kind of stuff, but it's coming out now. So um, it's interesting for cardiovascular diseases, of course also for brain diseases, this is vascular, let's say, uh, EVC, uh, um, uh, a brain, uh, when, a, when a vessel, uh, a vessel is, is blocked in the brain, then of course they don't have enough oxygen, so you want to give it more. And in cancers also, because uh, most tumors are hypoxic, strongly hypoxic. So this is a compound which we derived for reasons which I can have in time to get into. One reason was a sort of obvious. Uh, in hemoglobin, the binding of oxygen is regulated by an allosteric effector, which is diphosphoglycerate. And this has led to lots of work. How can one uh, then modulate the uh, oxygen level and the, uh, the um, release of oxygen from, from uh, red blood cells by different phosphates, maybe by replacing the um, diphosphoglycerate or by having another thing, which is the Bohr effect, where you change the pH inside the red blood cell. So it has two actions. One is to, it increases what is sure, although the mechanism is a bit complicated, what is sure is that the delivery of oxygen from lead bus cells is increased, and it also has an effect on uh, the, PI, the PI3 kinase, and, uh, which is uh, um, st stabilized. OK, now let me just show you some results. 
when you have heart failure mice, they cannot run as well as normal mice on a treadmill. But if you inject a substance into them, they run as well. And of course, normal mice run much better. There's another application, as you can imagine. But it's not really accepted one. So you see that the problem is that it's for any medicine chemist in the room, they would say this compound is of no interest because it's much too water soluble. That's true. So it goes out of the body very quickly. So you have to use large, anti large quantities in order to have a high enough level in the serum and so that have an effect, otherwise it goes out. And that is why you use three kilograms per kilo. That's a big amount. So when we asked uh, a company to make the compound for us in GME con CMP conditions, it is not 10 grams, it's 10 kilos, which we need. But you will see. So what about oncology then? Since tumors are hypoxic, what can one do if one restores normoxia without going into mechanisms? There's a lot of discussion about that, but let me just give you results. So when you implant um, a, a, a liver tumor into a rat, on top, we have many more data, but I just show you one slide. Uh, the controls here, after a few weeks, five weeks, you see the huge tumor there, after five weeks they have, and they are all gone. If you treat with doxorubicin, which is, I have seen in many of the presentations here, there's doxorubicin. That stuff is around for years and years and years. It's still used. So it's, uh, well, that means also we don't have too much. Doxorubicin has a sort of effect. It prolongates a little bit, but not much. And then you use our compound, ITPP, inositol 3 pyrophosphate, and all the tumor goes. In this experiment, there were 10 rats. One of them died, but the other ones, nine, had no tumor anymore. So there is a need eradication of implanted. It's very important to write down that it's implanted tumors, because implanted tumors come from cultures, and they are less not so, they are not spontaneous tumors, so they are much more sensitive. So uh, there's much of the data may be uh, are not the same if you are a human being and have a tumor. Huh? Ex very surprisingly and extremely excitingly, when you go to pancreatic cancer, which is a horrible stuff, as you know, when you get uh, diagnosed by pancreatic cancer, you know that you have between one month and one year, something like that, and then finished. Now here, the person who did these experiments, it's not in my group, this was done with some in collaborations. Uh, the un, you see the untreated control, and then you did the one, see the one treated with gemcitabine, which is the this thing also still used. It's also an old stuff, which is still used in, in clinic. When somebody has pancreatic cancer, what they usually get is gemcitabine, which is just a palliative, it doesn't help much. But it prolongates a little bit. And then when you combine the two, ITPP with pancreatic, uh, with gemcitabine, with a, the, the optimal dose which were found in this case, all the tumors disappear. There is none left and the, ra the rats have a normal, a normal life, which is quite incredible. They are all the, 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 the remarks I made about the fact that they are implanted tumors, that usually you, uh, they are more sensitive to what you do, but in this case, on these rats, and this is now being developed, we, have, we are now in phase two, in, in, uh, clinical studies in, the lab, in uh, Zurich, uh, with, in the laboratory of Pierre-Alain Clavian. And uh, there's a first cohort has gone through, and a second cohort comes up. Of course, COVID-19 had stopped the whole thing. Just to show you that, okay, I, when I see these results, I said, it must work. Okay, let's be careful because also in the clinic, what you usually get is people who have already been treated by all kinds of things. So you get them at the end of the line, and in order to see something, how do you, you know, people are already so bad in, uh, in their health is already so bad that seeing that something that's a, has an effect, but three people in 30 had an effect. I consider for a chemist, 10% uh, yield is terrible, <laughs> but. If you are part of the three, you are very happy about it. Furthermore, as I said, most of these people are already on the end of the line. And so you don't see so much.
but the second cohort, which will be started pretty soon, where they will make some selections, uh, okay, which is, must be something terrible for a physician to say, this person gets it, this doesn't get it. Big responsibility. Okay, so gene transfer, I jump now to back to the main theme. Gene transfer, we have done quite a bit of work on this, which is also, uh, nobody knows much about this, the fact that it has been done. This was a compound we developed now about 30 years ago, uh, where uh, we use guanidinium groups rather than ammonium, because ammonium, trimethyl ammonium, is toxic, whereas guanidinium is much less toxic. And it's quite a good compound for transferring. And one of my brothers, he works on uh, cystic fibrosis, and here he has a, uh, is a picture which shows transfection of beta galactosidase, which can be colored in blue, cells can be colored in blue, blue, and then you see that, in fact, the epithelium there is blue. So it has been transfected just by installation in the mouth of the mouse. Another one which was of interest, which has, which has to do also with RNA, because RNA now is up there in the sky, brightly so, is that if you use uh, different kinds of uh, aminoglycosides, aminoglycosides have OHs. So our very primitive way of looking at it is to say RNA has one OH more than DNA, so maybe it's something interesting to be done. And so we used aminoglycosides of different types, and uh, one can get an efficient transfer of siRNA in the cell and also interference activity, that means release. Because when you have the, the sugars, the carbohydrates with three units are quite different from the ones with four units. And by electron microscopy, one can see that the one with four un the three units are onion-like, and the one with four, uni with four units are much less organized. So it's probably a release of the, uh, the cargo uh, when, uh, when it's uh, a question of release of the cargo. Okay. Uh, another thing around the same, making liposomes which have a recognition group, a synthetically introduced recognition group, and uh, having uh, the recognition group, then a spacer, and then a lipophilic, a lipophilic tail, and uh -huh, uh -huh. And so this is the compound. It was based on hydrogen bonding, like uh, nucleosides and nucle nuclear bases. But if you use barbituric acid and triaminopyrimidine, you have three hydrogen bonds which form. In addition, you can also ionize. So in addition, you have also an electrostatic interaction. And the result is that you can then use these compounds with a lipophilic tail to put them in a membrane of a vesicle, of a, uh, which you can then, of course, synthetically make. And the result is the following. If you have this, is just representing the complementary head groups and the tails. Before mix, if you take one type, one, uh, one kind of, uh, uh, of uh, vesicle with one, the red one or the green one, if you let it stand, it's just a nice, uh, ni a nice vesicle you see by electron microscopy. But then, if you, let, if you add the complementary unit, before, uh, uh, after mixing, there's an aggregation, as you can see, very strong aggregation, and you wait a little, it's a fusion. So there's some possibility to make vesicles fuse, and this, of course, opens the idea that maybe you can use it to fuse with a cell membrane. We didn't do that, but it's just uh, we wanted to see if recognition features in domains, in, uh, in uh, objects like vesicles, have any interest. Okay, I drop that. Yeah, now, so this uh, was a rundown on some of the things we had been doing over the years. And here, the chemistry done rest, rests on trying to design an object to put the interactions, like hydrogen bonds, complementary hydrogen bonding sites, in the, the, two, in the objects which interact. So to inform it and to program the system. Of course, we have done much more than this, but this was just to illustrate. And so you can then uh, uh, have a lead to a control generation of functional entities. But then there is another step beyond that. Once you have done that, you ask the question, what is a step beyond in sort of complexity of the system? It is selection, introducing a selection process, meaning that the system would then 
not just do the right thing when you give them the right thing to eat, but in a mixture of objects, it would find out the correct object for building itself up. For this, you need diversity in the type of entities which will interact and dynamics so that the first collision doesn't lead to something too strongly bound. Otherwise, you cannot explore the hypersurface, the, electric, the uh, thermodynamic hydro hypersurface. So this then leads to this uh, chemistry, which I will illustrate a little bit more, which I call constitutional dynamic chemistry. It's a chemistry which deals with the constitution of the chemical object. It's not dynamic because of, a, of rate. It's not dynamic because of motion, like molecular machines, but it is dynamic by chemical splitting and getting together again, reversible chemical reactions. If the system changes between uh, this, the uh, breaking of the object and the reforming, then it may change, its, this, the system may change the response and inc incorporate other type of pieces, bricks, and lead to adaptation. And now we are mostly interested in this area, adaptive chemistry. Okay. Um, of course, supramolecular chemistry, because the interactions are rather labile, hydrogen bonding, uh, this is automatically dynamic. Supramolecular objects, they break apart, and they reform. Huh? Like in water, a glass of water molecules, they break up, they, they interact, break up, interact, break up. That's why that there's a super, the, the uh, properties of water is a, a supramolecular. An isolated molecule in the gas phase does not have the properties. It cannot freeze, it cannot boil, of course. So this we call a dynamic non-covalent chemistry, which is built in. Supramolecular chemistry is by definition a dynamic, constitutional dynamic chemistry. Now you then ask the question, can one import these properties of falling apart into molecules. When I started that work, the PhD student was saying, what is this guy doing? He wants us to make molecules which break apart. We have been taught that you want to make molecules which are stable. But if they can break apart, you have new properties which molecules which cannot break, not dissociate into pieces, do not possess. You will see in a moment. This is a dynamic covalent chemistry. So if you want to put both things over the same heading, you can see, see that it's a constitutional dynamic chemistry. That means the dynamicity resides in the interactions either between molecules leading to supramolecular entity or with, is inside the molecule if you can introduce a reversible bond, a bond which is reversibly formed and dissociated. And of course, an obvious one, for that, this, uh, yeah, this then leads, of course, towards adaptive chemistry because uh, it can uh, respond to agents in the, in, the, in the environment. Now, what is that good for? It is good for generating uh, dynamic libraries. When I got a PhD, a library was called a mixture which you couldn't handle and you put it in the sink. But now it's a nice name. You put, call it a library, well, which is true. Huh? And then uh, the diversity can be on both levels, supramolecular or molecular, and it enables selection. So what functionalities or what can we do with it? Either searching for biologically active substances, I will give you the principle, but only the principle. Dynamic nanostructures, which might be applicable here, but I haven't much, I, it's a bit, it's a very different area, so I didn't put it in and also constitutional dynamic materials, making materials which can break apart, where the constituents can break apart. Now, a typical reaction, and so emblematic even, is of course simply condensing an amine with a carbonyl, and you make imines, and it is reversible, okay? Nicely reversible, and it depends also a little bit on the type of amine you use, of NH2 you use, it can be um, an aliphatic, an aromatic, uh, it can be a hydro, a hydrazine, it can be an acyl hydrazine, it can be an oxime, um, hydro, hydroxylamine. So that is what we do. I will illustrate some which use this very, that's a very important reaction because it is uh, in chemistry, but uh, also, there are not many aldehydes uh, or CHOs, except uh, pyridoxal phosphate, of course, is one aldehyde, which is very important in biology, but there are not many. But nevertheless, the reaction is nicely reversible. So 
First of all, you can try to develop a method for drug discovery by these dynamic ways. And let me show you the following way. If you have components of all types of structures which have a reactive function which can undergo a reversible reaction, if you mix those together, what do you get? A mixture, a horrible mixture of constituents. But you have access to all the combinations in principle. Huh? All combinations are accessible, even if they are not there at the moment where you mix, but at least the combinations can exist. So now what, you, what do you do with that? You simply use a basic law of thermodynamics, the law of mass action, the Chatelier's principle. You add a receptor, some kind of a cavity molecule, or, or can be a protein, and of course, what binds best will be amplified. Huh? The lock will pick up what is the best in this mixture and amplify it. And so the whole system, that is the principle of the law of mass action, it will amplify the system which binds best. And so uh, you can then search for the best binder. We have, apply, have applied that, first of all, to inhibitors which were well known. For instance, inhibitors of carbonic anhydrase, where the result was known. So we, we use the system so as to show that if you have a mixture and add carbonic anhydrase, you get the one which is best, which is closest to the best inhibitor, which is known. And it was also done for other things. So it's a sort of an adaptation of the system to the addition of this receptor site. 30 minutes. Okay, that's good. I'm quite fast, so that's not so bad. <laughs> You can also think of making drug delivery systems. This is, of course, more complicated, and people will immediately jump up and say, yes, you have all these combinations. You have to prove that each of them, that none of them, of these combinations is toxic or so on, if you want to have a drug, really. But, okay, maybe someday, you know, you could dream of the fact that you have a, a universal library of possibilities. After all, we, have, we are just based on a limited number of amino acids. And our genome is based on four letters. So you don't need an enormous amount if you have a lot of possible combinations. So maybe it is possible to make someday dynamic drugs where the drugs would, where the right drug for a given disease would automatically be generated by the disease itself. Let's dream, huh? Why not? <laughs> you can then have a controlled release of drugs and so on, dynamic comparator libraries, dynamic mixtures, and then what you would have is you could also have sequential release because the imines are not all the same in terms of reversibility. And we have also worked with Firmenich to try to make reversible perfumes. Huh? So if you have a mixture of perfumes where some are primary amines, the other ones are uh, hydrozones and the other ones are oxymes, you can smell violet in the morning and rose in the evening because of the kinetics. Oh, sure, that's possible. The trouble is, of course, uh, there are so many now regulations for even for perfume that, uh, okay, you have to prove that none of the combination has any effect. That's not my job. <laughs> I leave it to others. Now, the thing, this question of materials, when you make supramolecular materials, of course, all materials are supramolecular because all materials, wood, everything, uh, is something which, is, uh, link, which is, comes from interactions between the constituents, uh, the components of the constituents. But something interesting came up. In 1990, we proposed to make supramolecular polymers. That means polymers where the monomers interact, not, are connected not by covalent bonds, but by non-covalent bonds. So by hydrogen bonds, for instance, and which you can make the main chain polymers, and which have features which depend on the connections between the monomers. And if, they are, if, these, uh, co if these connections are hydrogen bonds, of course, they have possibilities of uh, being adaptive and so on, which others don't have. So in 1990, we, read, we wrote this first paper on that. And then, OK, people began to interested, polymer chemists, especially the group of Bert Meyer in Eindhoven, and they developed a system. In, and then some thought that maybe I can make them biocompatible. So that I received in 2020, uh, 2013, which means 23 years after this first paper, a mail from uh, a small company which had developed 
such type of supermolecular polymers for cardiovascular implants. And this company, Xeltis, had made this compound for reconstructing the heart of children who had, uh, who had a severe cardiovascular, uh, uh, cardiac um, malformation. And I show you now, the first little girl was trans implanted on uh, October 23, 2013. Here is Dominica and Professor Leo Bukheria, the surgeon who did it in the Bakulev Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow. Yeah, both uh, look quite happy, huh? And of course, we were very happy. Something which has been started without any, uh, any, any goal of making it usable in such a way is something which um, makes you happy, even if you are especially interested in uh, basic research. But sometimes, you see, in scientists, they work everywhere in the world, and the short comes from where you don't expect it. We did not expect that this would be the first application. Now, okay, many more have been treated by now, and they have also now made hard valves for children also. And the, the, the compound, uh, for instance, the, the little girl had an, only one ventricle, so I had to put a separation as to have two, two, pass, two regions of the heart. And then the normal cells, they invade it, and then it disappears. Okay. Um, more material-oriented, this is a supramolecular polymer film, which you can barely see because it's almost a perfect film. Uh, which uh, is here, uh, which is stretched between the fingers of my Indian postdoc who did the work, somebody else, because they have only two hands, so the third hand is from another co-worker, who cleaves it in two, cut, then you superimpose the two halves, you press, we did it with the finger, which was not so very much scientific, because we didn't know what much, but you just press it with a thumb, and you wait for a few minutes, and you can stretch, and it sticks. And two years after, it still works. We have, tried, we have done it. it, it this works. You just cleave, put on top of each other, and press. So there's a lot here also which can be done, uh, making it rather simple. And in fact, this is published. The film is made from two compounds you find in the Aldrich catalog. So it's not too difficult. So, um, yeah, so what else can one do with it? One can, for instance, reveal that it works by look, looking at optical properties. It's always nice to see. Seeing is believing. Huh? So if you see it, you sort of think that it should be all right. Wait a minute. This has suddenly jumped to seven minutes. What happens? OK, it's all right. If I have more minutes, this gives me more minutes. <laughs> OK. So um, the optical properties, this is a, this, uh, this um, di dicarbonyl diamine, which gives polyimines, OK? Now, suppose you make two different films, one having A, dialdehyde, and B, a diamine. And then you use another dialdehyde, A prime, and B prime, another diamine. You make these films. Now you superimpose them by a corner. And uh, what happens where this corner is? This corner can generate, at the corner, you can generate the two combinations which were not known, which were not present. A with B prime and A prime with B. If one of these two new ones has some kind of an optical characteristic, like a color of fluorescence, then you will, see, of course, see it. So this was done with uh, co-workers which had been sent to my lab, uh, Mitsui Chemicals in Japan. They were interested in it because they wanted to see what one can do with this type of stuff. So the Japanese co-workers, they liked very much these small pictures. That's the head of, of a cat, where polymer AB is the head and the ears, and A prime, B prime is the inside of the ears, the eyes, and the mustache. So you leave it, you heat it a bit, and you see where it is superimposed. You have one of the, we knew that, of course, that one of the new combinations must have these colors. You do it beforehand so as to know if you get a result or not. But it's quite convincing, and you can also think of writing at the interface with a heating laser, for instance, at the interface of two films, or you can make a stack, a millefeuille, and you write in three dimensions then. Okay, 
Now, this has also been extended to the three classes, the, the common class, classes of uh, biological uh, polymers. I, I, again, I, have, I haven't time to get into details. You can make DNAs, dynamic nucleic acids, by, but you have always to modify because you have to introduce the reversible functions, of course. You can make dynamic peptoids where uh, you have amino uh, derivatives of amino acids which can then condense together to make a, pep a sort of peptoid which has uh, double bo uh, imine bo double bonds. This was done by Anna Hirsch, who is she did very nice work. She is now a professor in Saarbrücken. And um, you can also make uh, main chain uh, sugars, which are also dynamic. And of course, we have just scratched the top of things, because if you mix together dynamic peptoids and dy dynamic glycodynamos, then you get, uh, uh, you get sh uh, sugar, you get polymers which have sugar units and uh, also uh, peptide units. OK, now, what about getting, getting a little bit deeper into the properties of this adaptation? In uh, the adaptation means that you change something, like the medium, the phase from, for instance, organic to water in a, piece, in a double phase system, a physical stimulus, heat or, or uh, pressure, chemical effector, or even a switching, changing the shape of a molecule. Of a molecule yeah. So these are adaptive chemical systems. And the most in interesting, I want absolutely to come to the end for that, that is you, don't, you cannot understand now what I mean by that, but the way a system can adapt simply because it can self-organize. But I will show you that later. OK, this is an experiment done with uh, the group of Paolo Samori. He's in our institute. He's doing uh, nanostructures. And he's studying the, the nanostructures by STM scanning dynamic microscopy. So we use this long chain aldehyde, which can deposit well on the graphite because it's an aliphatic long chain, so it likes to stick to a graphite, and three different diamines, C2, C6, and C12. And this was dissolved in phenyloctane and looked at by NMR. What you see by NMR, something totally uninteresting, a mixture of the, the uh, monoimines. That means not even do you get the diimines, you get monoimines and the mixture of the C2, the C6, and the C12. Then you take a drop of that solution and put it on a graphite surface. And look at it, you, like you get a deposit, and look at the deposit by uh, STM, scanning tunneling microscopy. What do you see? Very nice deposit, very organized deposit, where you have only tiny means and only the C12, which means the simple physical adsorption forces have driven the system to select, the, to, to push it to diamine and to select the C12, because that's the one which deposits best. So adsorption, simple adsorption on the surface, in, the, in this case graphite, drives the reaction to completion and drives selection. This is then sort of what you can say it's adaptation to the adsorption on the surface, but of course it depends on the surface. We should have tried other ones. We didn't try it, but uh, this was on, a, on graphite. So it's a self-organization on the surface, and one can even say, okay, I don't claim that that has anything to do with, with the origin of life, but if you have a mixture of molecules generated in some way, in a random way, huh, we know that this is possible. If, you are, if this, uh, this is sitting on, uh, on clay or on, uh, um, on cal calcare, what is that again? Yeah. You know what it is, calcare. Cal limestone. Huh? Limestone, yes, sir, thank you. <laughs> limestone and uh, quartz, why not? Huh? You have can all these things. The deposits could be quite different. So you have a selection by the simple adsorption forces. But okay, this is maybe an interesting factor. OK, now let's analyze a little bit more deeply. I will take a simple case, because then it can become very complicated, but how you can represent this. Because these molecules which exchange pieces, they talk to each other all the time. Because if one releases one piece, if one constituent releases one component, the other ones know that this is now free to, to eat. And so they, the equilibrium can change. 
So if you look at that, and I take again what I used earlier as a technique, where uh, you have four components, A, A prime, B, B prime, and the A's react with the B's. So you can make four constituents, A, B, A, B prime, A prime pre, and A prime, B prime. Now, four, that's what? That's a square. Huh? So you can put them on the corners of a square, and you, can, you find out that what links the, uh, the, the, the uh, constituents on the perimeter on the, uh, on the, of the square is, are constituents which share a component. AB shares A with AB prime, and it shares B with A prime B. So these are antagonists, because if AB wants to increase in a closed system, then of course it has to take the A from AB prime and the B from A prime B. So if AB increases, these two decrease, they are antagonists. But the, the diagonals are much more interesting. The diagonals link constituents which do not share a component. So if AB increases, as I just said, it releases A prime B prime, which can make A prime B prime. So the ones which do not share a component, they, in a, again, in a, this is not a simple system. But if you make it more complicated, there are more complications coming in. But if AB increases, A prime B prime must increase. Even if it doesn't want, it must increase. So you can have an adaptation to say, different factors which can act on it. And you have something which I consider very important, what I call agonist amplification. The fittest, that means, for instance, AB can react with the middle ion. So the middle ion will amplify that. But it will amplify the one which binds best the middle ion and leave over the one which is the worst for binding the middle ion. But maybe it's useful for something else. In other words, if you have the agonist amplification, the fittest drives the amplification of the unfittest for a given feature, a given property. This unfittest can be very interesting for something else, for instance, generating a color. So these are adaptive chemical networks. OK, now uh, I show you now the example which illustrates that. Uh, I have several examples, but uh, another one is simpler, but I would have to change reaction. It's not an imine anymore. So, you know very probably that guanine residues can make what are called G quartets, huh? the guanine quartets. This is well known for many, many years. And they are stabilized by a metal ion, usually, which you see here in the middle, the, the, the metal ion. So, here we used guanosine, modified the CH2OH to make a hydrazid. Uh, you oxidize the acid and then you make the treat with hydrazine. OK, now, this then assembles to give the quartet, the G, G quartet, which is there. Now, it is also known for many, many years that these things then they can stack on top of each other. In other words, these are, so let's say, supramolecular macrocycles, which can, can stack and make sort of a column and give um, hydro, hydrogels. Huh? Uh, just to show you here, you, you get the gels. This is electron microscopy of that. Now, what can this to us, tell us? First of all, let's see if the, guan, if the guanine residue is not present. It cannot make the G quartet. It cannot make the hydrogel, the gel. Okay? And so it remains a solution. And of course, a solution is much less organized than a gel. Confiture is quite organized compared to a, to a solution. So, if you mix together two aldehydes, pyridoxal phosphate and this, sulfo uh, this uh, sulfonated uh, benzaldehyde, and on the other hand, a derivative of um, alanine and a derivative of serine, you mix those together, and what happens is what you expect, that you get 25% of each combination. Huh? which is, as you see, no selection, there is no gel, nothing. But now you do the simple thing of replacing uh, the, the AA, the, one, the alanine one, with the guanine, which can now form the G quartet and can then form a gel by piling up, by taking columnar polymer. OK, that's it. You start with this, and you, you look at what you get. 
by NMR, and you can look at the peaks. You see the peak of the imine protons, and you can look at that. So what you find in the solution, in other words, this mixture now, in NMR, you do not see the gel. What forms the gel is sticky, and so has very, very broad NMR signals, so you can re not really see them. But the ones which do not, which are not part of the gel, which are in the water, which is in the gel, in, in the, in the, the uh, hollow spaces in the gel, these are mo mobile, and there they, you can see them. So you find out that in the solution, you have A, B prime, A prime, B prime, and A prime, B. And therefore, by difference, of course, you know that the other one is A, B, because okay, the, the, the molecules don't disappear in thin air. So the gel must be a gel formed by A, B. And then you just look, you measure, and you find out that indeed, uh, the uh, A prime B prime must, of course, lead to an equivalent quantity of AB, which is the gel, which is amplified, and then uh, um, a, a, down, a down regulation of the other two, which means that you, have, you amplify the one which forms the gel because you form the gel. Huh? It's a sort of a cyclic thing. Because a compound forms a gel, if you're in the region where the gel can form, it will amplify the one which forms the gel. In other words, organization drives the selection of the ones which gives organization, which give organization. You can also then calculate the driving force just because of the ratios. It's not 25, 25, 25, 25 anymore. And uh, it's a selection which is driven, driven by the fact that the system can lead to organization. So this idea that an organized system has some properties leads also to a selection of what makes the organization. Let me just put them together now. So at the beginning, if you are in conditions where you are in, that means you, all you do, you heat the gel until it melts, then you get a solution. In that case, you get equivalent quantities of each. Not exactly equivalent, but very closely. Then you go, you lower the temperature, and you go in the region where the gel can form. And then the gel forms and amplifies the one which forms the gel. And you have an effect, which is gel formation. You go to an organized state by self by, because the system can self-organize, can form the gel. So if you look at it in the way I have shown earlier, with this representation, you have self-organization driving the selection and amplifying the constituents, which are the right ones, leading to that. So that's an adaptation, an adaptation to the fact that you can organize. Again, this comes in my, in my talks when I speak about these things more specifically. The fittest drives the amplification of the unfittest. The unfittest is in the water, and that's the most soluble in the water. It's the one which does not want to form a gel. So uh, the, the uh, self-organization drives the selection of the constituents which lead to the gel, so it's a self-amplification of organization, if you want. And again, maybe, huh? the fact that matter can self-organize and can lead to selection under the, let's say, the pressure of being able to generate in the system a, uh, an entity which is more organized than the others, that is something leading to more complex states of matter, to organized states of matter. So that's partly how organization can occur. So, I like to say that if organization can happen, organization will happen. Now, that's a strong statement, I must say, but it, it's part of the game. Huh? If we exist, that's because, if I may sort of take that language, because the structure of our, of our universe is such that organization is a driving force for selecting what can organize. It has nothing to do, it's not contrary to entropy, but that's another discussion we can have because it's delta G which is important, not delta S. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S. So it's delta G which drives. So, okay, maybe I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't put question marks for myself because there's a drive to organization. It's a cosmic imperative and life is not an accident. Life is a result.
it doesn't solve the problem. But I think thermodynamics push us there that way. OK. Thank you. <laughs>
I showed you systems which were at equilibrium at the end. But we have, a, we have now two cases where in this, um, in this square thing, where you had a diagonal this way, where kinetically it goes from this way to this way. Uh, because in the, in the, in the course in the, of the reaction, uh, there is uh, amplification of one. It's a bit difficult to describe. I should have this, uh, the, the pictures. And kinetically, you have a kinetic a system which kinetically forms the axis, which is opposite to the thermodynamic one. So I think one should, one must look at the kinetics of this system also. We have looked at it, but uh, first of all, it was not too much adapted to what is going on here. And secondly, we have, we have done some examples of that. Thank you for the question. <laughs> also, you see, if you have mixtures, for instance, of, uh, of imines, where you have, as I said before, um, primary uh, aliphatic amine, aromatic amine, and then uh, acyl hydrazone, or hydrozine, uh, acyl hydrazine, hydrozine, you call it, and then uh, hydroxylamine. These have very different kinetics. They form C and double bonds, but the reversibility is very different. The oxymes are much more stable than a primary amine. So if you mix those things together, and if something happens with the primary amine, the oxyme have long time and will adapt much later. So there are lots of things to exploit. Um, so thank you very much for this stellar talk, uh, especially addressing the questions of uh, origin of life. I think w what is Where there else to ask? I'm here. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> um, this is the most amazing question um, to address, I guess. And so I, I was wondering about the energy that you put into the reactions, because as my my lessons in chemistry are far back, I have to admit, but. Um, remembering the things I have been told is that um, organization requires energy, if I'm remembering correctly. And so does yet like the self-organizing um, aspect of matter still respect the, the laws of thermodynamics that yes, yes. sort of organization also requires energy um, and is thus um, yeah, and endothermic? No, it, it becomes more stable huh? because uh, you go, you, you, the organization is, if you are in the right conditions, you get, you get organized system because it's more stable. So it is the delta G is lower. That's the, ever, uh, delta, everything goes to lowering delta G. And delta G, as I said, is delta H minus T delta S. So the formation, for instance, you take a hydrogen, at, a hydrogen molecule, you make it from two hydrogen atoms. Each of the hydrogen atoms has three degrees of, uh, of translation. One, two, three. The other one also. So you have six degrees of freedom. If from that you make hydrogen molecule, you have only three degrees left. So you have lost three degrees of translation. And this is due to the fact that you make a bond. The bond has an energy which binds things together. So that is why it works. Otherwise, we would not exist. Huh? We would be just... Atoms <laughs> floating around in space. Thanks for your fascinating talk. But I also found this discussion now very interesting because thermodynamically, your system is searching for the largest entropy, meaning your thing which you call organization is thermodynamic death of, the, of matter in some way. Is what? Is the thermodynamic death of something by finding the lowest uh, lowest point? Yes, so somehow it, it, it's a contrasting. No, it's no, it's no, a it's question of wording. It drives the system. In a, it's still the G. No? You have you have enthalpy. You have energy which makes the bonds. It doesn't. It's not against entropy. Entropy in the universe. Entropy increases, but locally you can make bonds. And then the, entropy, the local entropy decreases. Okay. Locally. Mm -hmm. So, Professor <laughs> Jean-Marie Lane, thank you so much. I, I'm sorry, but it, 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 you see, let's see, I reverse the system. The fact that you exist means that it's right. 
<laughs> Otherwise, you would not exist. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are welcome.